All right, everyone, welcome back. So today I'm going to be taking a look at a book called Democracy for Realists that is something a little bit different. It's a work of political science that takes a look at democracy, mass democracy in a very empirical way. It goes through political science, sociology, psychological research, and does something that not many political scientists or works of political science have done, which is to just ask, does democracy do anything like it says it does or like it's supposed to do uh, after all of this long experiment we've had with mass democracy uh, is there any point to it does it actually produce responsive governments does it actually uh, create the will of the people in politics and you'll see as we look at this that it's a pretty emphatic no and i think this is worth going over i mean some will say you know, we know the criticisms of democracy and we have these sort of reactionary critiques of democracy. But this is this is really a kind of deep layer of critique where it's like, you know, a lot of people will say, well, of course, you know, modern liberal democracy is bad. It's a problem. But if we had more representative governments, if we had, uh, you know, proper moral belief system across society, perhaps we could have like a quite responsive democracy. Perhaps we could have a pretty successful democratic system. Now, what's in this work and the other stuff outside here really undermines that assumption. Um, but to start this off, and this is how the authors start this, is Christopher Atchin and, and Larry Bartels. Uh, everyone thinks their country is democratic. That's one of the interesting things is you go to China, Russia, the US, France, you poll people, they all think they live in a democracy. Uh, if anything, you can almost predict a, a country is going to be a dictatorship if it has a title like Democratic People's Republic in its name, right? So not only does everyone believe they live in a democracy, but every regime kind of justifies itself as a republic or as a democracy as representing the will of the people. And the authors call this the, the folk theory of democracy, the kind of simple everyman way of, of looking at democracy. You vote in uh, representatives they enact will of the people. Uh, democracy is a good thing. It's unqualifiedly a good thing. And if there's a problem with democracy, it's because of specific individuals or institutions, and it can be solved with more democracy. So this is the kind of underlying uh, assumption a lot of people operate with. But also, Poland shows complete schizophrenia on views of democracy. For example, most Americans say that democratic government is a very important factor in the nation's success. But most also believe that the government is pretty much run by a few big interests looking out for themselves. And this is a quote from this book. They say, every few years, another book, perhaps employing new data and the fashionable scientific methodology of the season, announces similar findings. In most cases, the authors examine the evidence, find the foundations of popular democratic theories inadequate, approach the edge of the critical abyss, and then skittishly back off finding one or another reason why all must be, or soon will be, well after all. Defences of the conventional faith, conceding a few difficulties but affirming the fundamental verities, generally predominate in both popular and scholarly conversation. So yeah, like I said, one of the few books where they want to tackle the problems of democracy head on and not just uh, make excuses for these problems. Now there is a critical tradition in sociology and political philosophy. Uh, obviously, this goes right back to the foundations of political philosophy, right? Plato was a fierce critic of democracy. Um, but yeah, folk theory of democracy imagines informed and engaged citizens making decisions. The problem is most people are busy with their lives and disengaged in politics for various reasons. It's a quote from Walter Lippmann, once you touch the biographies of human beings, the notion that political beliefs are logically determined collapses like a pricked balloon. In the mid-20th century, political science and sociology emerged, which consistently undermined the ideals of folk theory. And this is kind of the story of, uh, of, of this work and of political science in the 20th century is, yeah, the more we study voting, voting behavior, the more we study the psychology of voters and, um, you know, what's really deciding the democratic process the more the traditional defenses of democracy break down on the mass level. And I would distinguish the mass level, mass democracy from democracy, because 
obviously we're talking about a totally different thing. You know, if you're talking about a, a township or I don't know, a village in Switzerland that has uh, uh, direct democracy and, and they vote on things in the, in the town hall. I mean, that's very different in terms of people's investment in the decision process and what they're deciding on than mass democracy, where you have millions of people, some of whom don't even share uh, culture um, or, you know, foundational moral beliefs. And if they're voting for candidates they've only seen on the television or they've never even heard the names of. Uh, you get a lot of problems as this scales up. Now, some of the first research that sort of started to cast out on this was uh, done by Columbia University. It's called the People's Choice. It was a study of the 1940 and 1940 elections. And it found surprisingly to political scientists that voter motivations were vastly different from what's imagined by democratic theory. And as you'll see, multiple studies have since repeated this discrepancy. So, yeah, they found voters not really deciding based on issues or ideology and just deciding how to vote, who to vote for on things that would really surprise, you know, political junkies, political scientists, people that have some faith in the democratic process, because it's not, it doesn't translate into anything that should be important in a democracy. But there were more sophisticated defenses of uh, this mass democratic model that emerged. Uh, and some of you tried to use, you know, insights from game theory and so on. And the spatial model was, was one such theory that came out of uh, economics. And I tried to give a mathematical form to this folk theory of democracy uh, and explain sort of a priori how this could work. Now, in this model, voters are assumed to maximize their ideological satisfaction with the election outcome by voting for the parties closest to them on the ideological dimension. Parties are assumed to maximize their expected payoff from office holding by choosing the platforms most likely to get them elected. In a two-party system, this should lead to the median voter being perfectly satisfied. Theory was very popular at first, seeming to explain the consensus politics of the mid-20th century. So, I mean, this isn't very complicated. You can kind of see from the, the illustration, you know, imagine a presidential race, right? Republicans run against each other. There's more extreme Republicans. There's more left-wing Republicans. Uh, the bulk of the voters will be in the middle. Uh, they will vote for the more moderate candidate, and they'll also be considering things like electability and appealing to moderates in the general election. Same thing with the Democrats. And then there's this phenomenon that's, that's talked about, you know, where people run more extreme in the, the primaries because they're appealing to their base, and then they moderate for the general election. And so you'll get two candidates that are more moderate within their party. They run against each other. They both moderate their position. Because, you know, the, the Democrat has support, uh, support of the, the left-wing voters already. The Republican has the support of the right-wing voters already. So they're really competing for the, the middle section that will flip. So they're competing for the median voter. Uh, you know, you have these, these swing states where maybe people voted for Obama in 2008, and they voted for Trump in 16, and maybe they flip, flip back to, to Democrat in, in 2020. And so these people become much more important to the elections, the people you can't count on. And so the spatial model would say, yeah, uh, politicians, they're rational. They want to secure as many votes as possible. And the way democracies play out, they have to appeal to this middle median voter. And that's a good thing for democracy, right? The far left are a little bit dissatisfied. The far right are a bit dissatisfied. The person in the middle is pretty happy the way things play out. And you get a kind of consensus-based politics. Now, it's nice on paper, but there are empirical challenges to all of these mathematical models that try to defend democracy on these, on these terms. Um, one of the things is that the model assumes uh, what they call a rationally ignorant voter, who, even if they don't have a well-worked-out ideology, they at least know their preferences. So, you know, maybe the, the this median voter doesn't uh, know the ins and outs of the Republican Party tax platform for next election. But they have an idea, you know, they, they maybe they want like they want some abortion, but they don't want it on demand and they want lower taxes. But they understand that they, you know, they have some like vague, uh, vague preferences. And then collectively on a mass scale, even if these preferences aren't that well informed uh, on a mass scale, you get a kind of informed public. Um, but the problem is that is is very questionable. 
in the 1980s, uh, 65% of Americans said that the federal government was spending too little to assist the poor, while only 20 to 25% said it was spending too little on welfare. Psychological indeterminacy revealed by so-called framing effects has undermined the value of public opinion on any issue. Very basically, just changing wording or even emphasis uh, in a question very slightly can totally flip public opinion. So it doesn't seem like you can even get uh, a preference out of the mass of people. Um, you may get them voting a certain way, obviously. But in terms of them being rationally ignorant, where they're, you know, they're perhaps ignorant on specific party policies, but they have a, a conscious preference, even that is questionable because it can be totally directed in any direction by you know, simply framing questions differently or you know, the environment they're in. Um, all sorts of factors that have nothing to do with what voters should be considering in a, in a democracy. Uh, according to defenses of democracy. There's also this impossibility theorem that was formulated by the economist Kenneth Arrow. It demonstrated mathematically that it is impossible to convert ranked preferences of a mass of individuals into a community-wide preference uh, without violating basic democratic principles. Democracy as a means of aggregating individual preference to determine a collective preference was shown to be logically impossible. Um, no, that might be a mouthful. I could get into that, but very basically, um, you know, without getting into all of the mathematics, which I couldn't explain myself, but you know, you have you rank A, B, C, and you have a collection of people that rank it, and I vote first preference A, second preference B, last preference C, and everyone does this. Uh, when you have a collective doing this, it actually doesn't translate into uh, a sort of collective choice that represents where people would be collectively on that for a variety of reasons and you can't satisfy that you can't find the sort of general will there without violating democracy so this was presented as a, a serious challenge to the idea that you can uh, democratize uh, things along these lines of um, uh, choice abc and then there's also been plenty of studies into the nature of how psychological belief is decided. You know, obviously that last point is very, uh, you know, this is focused on like the game theory aspect and the defenses uh, economists offer for rational choice and so on. But you can just look at voters' behavior, how they think, how they form their beliefs, um, how their beliefs change. And there was a groundbreaking essay in this regard called The Nature of Belief Systems in Mass Publics by Philip Converse in 1964, provided a devastating and influential portrait of the political thinking of ordinary citizens. Converse concluded that many citizens do not have meaningful beliefs, even on issues that have formed the basis for intense political controversy among elites for substantial periods of time. First, he found little evidence voters understood ideological concepts used in political discourse. Around 3% of voters were clearly classifiable as ideologues, with another 12% qualifying as near ideologues. The vast majority of voters seem to think about parties and candidates in terms of group interests or the nature of the times, or in ways that conveyed no shred of policy significance whatever. Second, there was little ideological consistency in beliefs, and these beliefs weren't well correlated with party preference. And third, the stability of these beliefs weren't consistent across time. Over a four-year period, the correlation coefficients measuring stability of belief was only 0.3 to 0.5, while party loyalty was 0.7. So after four years, they re them on their beliefs, and there's less than a half chance that they will even maintain the beliefs they had four years ago, but they do maintain party loyalty. Um, so again, uh, it calls into question how much the, the voting decisions are, are being decided on based on, on any issues. And in later studies conducted on the more ideological France, I think Converse himself con conducted one of these, um, he found that most voters did not understand the left-right distinction or where parties fit on it. And this has been done in, in other countries, it's been done in the UK. Most people don't understand the left-right distinction. They're not voting for the left-wing party, they're not voting for the right-wing party. Uh, they have other ways of deciding how they vote. It's just a kind of force of habit to vote for a political party or, or some impression they have of a party. But people basically don't understand this, you know, ideological uh, game they're partaking in uh, in democracy. And how ignorant are the masses? Well, 
the answer is very. And uh, you could fill a book full of these, but just for the purposes of illustrating this, in a nationwide study conducted in 2018, only 26% of respondents could correctly name the tree branches of the U.S. government. 2015 survey, 30% of Republican primary voters supported bombing the fictional city of Agraba, which is the setting of the Disney movie Aladdin. 2017 survey conducted in Australia, 40% of respondents were unable to correctly identify the party leaders of the major political parties. 2015 survey in Germany showed that about 20% of respondents were unable to name any political party. 2019 poll found one in four Australians had never heard of the then Prime Minister. 2016 survey in Latin America found that around 40% of respondents didn't know the difference between a democratic and a non-democratic regime. And I thought this one was interesting. In 1964, only a minority of citizens knew that the Soviet Union was not a member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And that was after the, the Cuban Missile Crisis at the height of the Cold War. So, you know, it really puts things in perspective to look back a little bit on history and see how just checked out the masses are for, for most of, of history in the democratic West, for all of history. But there is this other defense that could be offered and has been offered by people who acknowledge this ignorance. They say, well, what well, Converse called the miracle of aggregation, uh, that a lot of people are ignorant, they make bad decisions, but when you pull millions and millions of people together, there is a kind of wisdom of the crowd. There's a, there's a wisdom of the masses you, know, you think of like the uh, uh, these things where people guess how many gumballs are in a, a jar or something, and individual answers very unlikely to be accurate. But you pool all of the answers together and you get an average. All of the bad answers, all of the good answers, it actually averages out to be quite accurate. And there's a French mathematician, uh, Condorcet, that demonstrated mathematically uh, this as it relates to jury pools. So if several jurors make independent judgment of suspects guilt or innocence a majority are quite likely to judge correctly even if every individual juror is only modestly more likely than chance to reach the correct, the correct conclusion and applied to electoral politics some have suggested that Condorcet's logic means that the electorate as a whole may be much wiser than any individual voter unfortunately this does not work in practice thousands or millions of voters are swayed by the same misinformation and propaganda if an incumbent government censors information on an issue, the resulting errors in citizens' judgments obviously will not be random. And even errors by politically neutral purveyors of information can massively distort political judgment. And I think you can probably think of plenty of uh, examples of this, even from recent election cycles. But yeah, this assumes that there's some objective thing there that we all share information about. You know, in the case of the big jar with gumballs, right, everyone is looking at the same thing. Everyone is judging the same objective piece of information. Mass democracy is, is totally different from that. Information is constantly manipulated. The masses aren't uh, all turning their rational or rationally ignorant gaze to one objective fact. Uh, they're, you know, they're within this, this matrix of, of manipulation and speculation and, and means of control. So there's just no reason to think that this, that this plays out on a, on a mass scale. Now, as this uh, cynicism uh, came out of some of these, these studies that were done in the mid-20th century about the, the nature of voters' political beliefs, uh, there have been a lot more studies done about how party leadership and uh, sort of party tribalism and just following individual political leaders' influences, uh, political beliefs and voting in democracy Voters may be influenced by issues, by persuasion, or projecting their views onto candidates. Theories of democracy assume the first, and they have to assume the first. Democracy as a system, no one would really be advocating it or would have advocated it if it was just going to be people vote for the most charismatic leader, or they kind of form themselves into political tribes and just vote along those tribes regardless of issues. Uh you have to assume for democracy to make any sense that people are deliberating over issues. But again, the sociology doesn't support this at all. Work published by political scientist Gabriel Lenz showed that policy evaluation plays remarkably little role in voter preference. Instead, 
the stances uh, their preferred candidates have chosen in an election determines their own view. Voters first decide they like a politician for other reasons than adopt his or her policy views. Lenz wrote that it was disappointing for scholars who see democracy as fundamentally about voters expressing their views on policy. This is the exact inverse of what we would expect in a functioning democracy, leaving politicians considerable scope to change their policies. Note how Republican voters moved seamlessly from the small government advocacy of the Tea Party during the Obama administration to the big spending nationalist platform of Donald Trump. You know, I remember Richard Anania did a, a subsack about this a year or two ago. Uh, just talking about the way conservative voters follow personalities, they follow uh, they follow television and, and these media personalities a lot, and they're very focused on sort of owning the libs rather than any consistent ideology. And this was the example he used, you know, that you had like this Republican base of opposition that they were into small government, uh, Tea Party libertarianism. A few years earlier, a lot of them had supported Bush and neocon foreign policy. And, you know, Bush was a big spender with the government. Uh, and then Obama came along, uh, sorry, rather Trump came along and he totally flipped the whole thing and said, uh, you know, when the whole, every candidate for the Republican Party was was uh, against socialized health care and all this stuff. And Trump came along and said, everyone's going to get health care and we're going to spend and we're going to uh, lower taxes and we're going to have this nationalist foreign policy. And then everyone became nationalist, right? So uh, clearly the, the personality of Trump, he kind of could have got any issue over uh, in a certain respect. I mean, if he... If he did go with a more sort of uh, libertarian line on some of that, the Republican supporters would have would have supported him anyway. Um, and this has been tested again and again empirically that people will change their beliefs to, to follow the leader that they want to vote for. Now, another defense that's been offered of democracy, and again, you can see the kind of dialectic here where people acknowledge well they say okay you know we don't have these deliberative individuals that the you know some of the enlightenment theorists maybe imagine could happen in a, a liberal democracy but there's still something there's still some means of accountability in mass democracy that's worth preserving and one of probably the main way of defending it is this idea of retrospective accountability um and so like i said a less idealistic defense of democracy the retrospective theory of political accountability argues that voters don't need to be especially informed on specific issues. Instead, they can judge the performance of politicians retrospectively based on their quality of life. And multiple studies have found that economic performance has a large impact on voter swings at elections. So the theory is politicians have an incentive to maximize their voters' well-being. Again, pretty simple, right? Uh, if the economy does well, you've better chance of getting reelected. If the economy is, is doing badly, uh, you have a better chance as an opposition politician uh, making promises to fix it. So, look, the masses can be totally ignorant. They can be checked out of politics for the most part. They don't have to be super rational. But they know they know what's in their pocket. They know if they have more money than they did four years ago or if, if prices are way, way up compared to the last time they voted. Uh, they know their quality of life, right? You don't need to be uh, ide uh, an ideologue. You don't need to be uh, someone who follows the news all the time to know how uh, how your own quality of life is. And this should produce responsive governments because politicians want votes. Again, they're, they're rational actors. They want to get elected. Um, and people will reward a good economy, a good quality of life. And so this should keep politicians focused on providing for ordinary people. Uh, so again, a pretty simple uh, theory that's been elaborated on to various degrees. Um, you know, there's entire books and tomes and formulas written about this to try and defend it. But this doesn't quite check out either uh, as a defense of, of mass democracy. It's not clear that voters can judge the performance of candidates based on their own welfare. Voters are bad at assessing changes in their own welfare, let alone how political parties have impacted it. So economic perceptions are not very well correlated with objective economic indicators. Uh, again, there's there are times when the economy is booming and people have a, a totally uh, just a you know a, a totally wrong perception of of where things are. I think there's some research to draw on later, but it's like when when Reagan was was in government and he he totally lowered the inflation rate that most Democrats thought it had gone up under. Um, but that's kind of the partisan effect coming in. But even aside from that, even the kind of apolitical, 
uh, nonpartisan voter, um, they're not very good at judging, like, objectively how well the economy is doing. Right, you could have a better standard of life that's totally paid for on borrowing for the last four years or something. Um, so there's, it's a bit naive to think that people's sort of subjective sense of where the economy is at the time they go out to vote, especially if they're kind of ignorant, uh, ignorant politically, uh, that they're, they're going to have any kind of sense of where things are objectively. And of course, these discrepancies can be exacerbated by the media enough to swing elections. Again, it's more about perception than any uh, objective indicator. And of course, the, the media really decide people's views on these things. Even if someone feels their quality of life is a bit better, well, you know, the media can say that it should be a lot better. Uh, they can compare it to other countries or they can compare it to, they can focus on specific bad policies. Voters bias, um, voters bias recent economic conditions rather than looking at the whole performance of a party. And some studies have even found that economic performance in the weeks leading up to the election is the best predictor of the outcome. Uh, but whether it's weeks or months, definitely like a few months to a year is what decides it rather than the whole four years prior. So it's a very myopic way uh, that voters uh, approach this. And most theorists advocating this approach just assume that past performance of a party is a good predictor of future performance. So again, I would say it's very naive to say that, well, if you can find some mechanism that uh, parties can be rewarded for a good recent uh, swing in the economy, you know, what is that really deciding? If, if that's your best defense of democracy, that's incredibly weak. And then in a global economy, of course, entire countries' economies can flourish or falter due to small fluctuations that are unrelated to political choices. For example, a 2013 study found that the fortunes of political leaders in Latin America could be predicted on the basis of international commodity prices and U.S. interest rates. And I think they found the same thing for uh, like politicians within within Texas, within individual U.S. states, even that the, the, the price of oil can totally change political perceptions of how well they're doing. Uh, uh, after the 2008 recession, there's another example of ruling parties in Europe were punished by the electorate equally, regardless of their performance against other OECD countries. So, you know, there are there are countries that managed to crash quite well relative to other countries, and there are some that were a total disaster. But the electorate all had around the, the same reaction, because for the electorate, well, things got worse. Uh, we're in a, an economic crash. It must be the politicians' fault, whoever's in charge. Um, and so you can see in the fact that it's it's the same reaction everywhere, regardless of what policies these governments are taking. And it doesn't even matter what, gov what, what policies they were taking. And another thing I would point out is people threw out left-wing governments for this uh, and elected right-wing governments, but they threw out right-wing governments and elected left-wing governments. I think Ireland is probably the best example because we had a Fianna Fáil government for all that time. Economy crashed with this huge property bubble. People blamed Fianna Fáil. Uh, Fianna Fáil suffered an election catastrophe. They fell to like historic lows, like around 10%. They've been the biggest political party in the country for as long as they've been around, really. But people just swung to the main opposition party, which was Fine Gael, which they were both like centrist liberal parties, like sort of centre-right. If anything, economically, Fine Gael was more centre-right. And in terms of doing that on the basis of punishing them for the, the property bubble and the economic crash, it was like the problem was Fianna Fáil had all of these sort of inflationary policies that were encouraging this property bubble. But Fine Gael were in that time proposing policies that would have been more inflationary, that would have made this bubble even worse uh, in terms of like abolishing stamp duty on property and abolishing some of these taxes to encourage more home building, to encourage more property speculation. So, again, if you're looking for some kind of deliberative process, retributive process where people say, well, they manage the economy, therefore uh, we'll punish them and put in this other party. Well, it's like the other party would have managed it just as badly. So in this case, you know, what is the electorate even deciding? There's no rational choice there. It's just go straight for the other guys. Uh, this is a, an interesting anecdote. Um Shark attacks and democracy. So in 1916, there were a series of four shark attacks in New Jersey. And this had the effect of really destroying the Jersey Shore tourism industry. 
three months later, Woodrow Wilson won election, but notably he lost New Jersey where he had lived and served as governor, and he lost it by 12 points. Uh, the same authors of this book conducted research studying the impacts of shark attacks on Wilson's share of the vote. And his vote collapsed most in the beach towns that were affected by loss of tourism. <clears throat> now, the study says every indication in the New Jersey election, uh, New, Jer- New Jersey election returns is that the horrifying shark attacks during the summer of 1916 reduced Wilson's vote in the beach communities by about 10 percentage points, which was an earthquake politically. And of course, shark attacks were random and there was nothing the federal government could have done to prevent them or to solve the loss of tourism. But voter reaction against Wilson came anyway, and it was totally irrational. More generally, when voters endure natural disasters, they generally vote against the party in power, even if the government could not possibly have prevented the problem. So this is a a study they focus on because it's like pure, like there's no... If you're a defender of, of mass democracy, like there's no sort of rationale behind this, right? Um, at the time, Woodrow Wilson lived in New Jersey. I think he's, he's like Secretary of State. Some of his, his big cabinet ministers uh, were from that area as well. They had a government meeting when this happened. They tried to do anything they could. There wasn't really anything they could do. Um, and now some people have tried to read into it retrospectively and say, oh, well, they could have done like a federal aid program or something. But that wasn't something that was ever considered at the time or that anyone would have kind of thought of doing like these kinds of modern ways we might respond to this uh, in terms of managing the loss of tourism. And But there was really no alternative. Um, And it's not like there was an opposition politician that was sort of blaming Wilson and saying that they had an alternative or he could have done X, Y, Z. It wasn't like that at all. It's just people went to the polls. They were pretty annoyed about the the loss of tourism so they just uh didn't vote for the current president so again it shows what's democracy what's this mass process really deciding here i mean in this case it's uh it's just this this random attack um and the president gets punished for it because he happens to be in power at the time it happened um and the fact that it's such a, a large swing what they call an earthquake politically it shows that on a bigger scale this kind of thing can decide elections Obviously, group identity is uh, central to voting behavior. Against the liberal ideal of humans as rational individuals, there is a realist tradition that exists in political uh, political science which views individual life as an expression of deeper group identities. Sociological and psychological studies in the mid-20th century began to show how powerful even superficial group identities are to how people think. Since then, a number of studies have shown how much group identity impacts voting behavior over ideology, again, undermining liberal ideals of democracy. So, you know, they've done plenty of studies like this. They put people in groups and they begin to identify uh, with their group against other groups, even if it's totally meaningless, like random selection, or people will change their perceptions of, of what's true. They'll, if all the people in the group they're in is, is saying that a line is, is straight when it isn't, the person will eventually start to answer that it is just to, to fit in. So we have a lot of research on how much people are determined by the, the groups they're in, even if they're quite arbitrary groupings. Um, so not ideology or policy preferences, but social identities and group attachments are actually what determine voting behavior. When asked to estimate their party's position on an issue like taxes versus spending, voters heavily overestimate how close their party is to their position. And as well as overstating their party's agreement with their views, voters use their partisanship to construct their own facts. Again, something that's quite concerning if you're a defender of democracy. Um, This idea was going around a couple of years back about alternative facts and how polarization and Trumpism was was creating this dangerous idea, but this isn't actually anything new in terms of how people think. A 1988 survey polled whether inflation had gotten better since 1980 under Reagan, uh, and the correct answer from the choices was much better, and almost half of what identified as strong Republicans gave the correct answer versus 8% of Democrats, and more than half of Democrats thought that inflation had actually gotten worse. So in terms of some kind of, um, uh, you know, 
party uniting left and right with just excellent policies it's it's obviously kind of a fantasy because even if even if you do something that can objectively be measured well most of the other side will just think you did the opposite anyway three years after the iraq war 41 percent of republicans versus seven percent of democrats believed saddam hussein had weapons of mass destruction um and yeah, I think it's the same thing. I mean, I often think with the, the war in, in Ukraine, you know, if, if if it was like Republicans in power right now, you'd probably have a lot more Democrats that would be peace activists and, and saying that this was a, I don't know, a war for, for military manufacturers or something. But of course, now they, they all support it because Democrats are in power, right? Uh, so parity over policy. This is, again, something that's been studied a lot. There was a Yale study titled Party over policy, the dominating impact of group influence on political beliefs. And this actually conducted multiple studies to determine this relationship. Uh, and again, the results there would be quite surprising to someone that believes in some of the ideals of democracy. Liberals and conservatives changed their view on the welfare state versus stringent welfare policies if they were presented with their party supporting the opposite. In fact, party stance was even more persuasive if it differed from what they had expected. And of course, they, they rationalized their stance. They'll say they support, uh, the, you know, this, they don't support a, a, a generous welfare state. They want stricter policies. Then they find out what the party position is. They change and then they kind of rationalize. Well, actually, I always agreed with this position. This was actually always my position. You know, I just wasn't uh, expressing it properly or whatever. In another study, 76% of participants submitted a negative evaluation of a policy proposal. So again, they were given a policy proposal related to something like a, you know, a welfare program. Uh, and when informed their party actually supported it, about the same number submitted a positive evaluation. So it was a total flip from 3 to 1 against it to 3 to 1 for just purely based on, um, well, this is from your, you know, this is from red team versus blue team. Group influence changed the values participants emphasized. Conservatives opposed a Democrat-supported job training program, which they viewed as excessive government interference. When it was changed to Republican policy, uh, it was viewed as a way of encouraging individual self-reliance. And the same flip happened with Democrats. At first, they were presented this policy, um, and they saw it as humanitarian aid. Well, look, this is obviously a great Democrat welfare program to help uh, to help the unemployed and so on. Um, but then when they found out it's actually a Republican program, they were like, oh, well, this is evil, big business Republicans just dumping these workers into into low skilled work and, and just like using the government to force these people to work. So um they can rationalize it, but they'll, they'll just basically just emphasize another value. So it's not like the Democrat flips to having a Republican value. Um, but they just change which value of theirs they emphasize, where it goes from being about helping the worker to, well, now for public support, it's kind of degrading the worker, right? Uh, participants were able to perceive the bias exhibited by other participants in the study, but rationalize that they were exempt from this bias. Another kind of interesting result from it. People can see how this impacts others. Everyone can see, oh, you know, like you see on, on social media now, look at these NPCs that just follow their, their party. Um, and of course, almost everyone is exhibiting this tribal behavior. Most people aren't, you know, contemplating their, their ideological positions and coming to, to, to any objective way. But they can see how other people just form their beliefs to fit into their political tribe. But they can't see the process happening themselves. And in this study, when they're asked... You know, well, how come you had the same process as everyone else? How come you ended up with that same position? They'll invent very, very elaborate, convincing ways that they actually uh, used reason to get themselves to that position, unlike everyone else. But of course, you take that out to the mass scale, you see that they're deluding themselves. But this isn't the whole story, and this wasn't, uh, this isn't covered in, in the work I've, I've been talking about, but this is a, another study. Um, that that kind of goes against some of this. I, I thought it was important to get this in, especially with where things are now politically. There is something that's deeper than politics. Like a lot of these studies have been talking about were about economic questions. Okay, Republicans will flip to Democrat positions on on uh, on something like social welfare. And actually, also something I, I didn't even mention about that was if 
if someone comes from the other side politically, they found that people are more likely to support them. So um, if a Republican is told that this is a, a Democrat supporting this Republican position, they're more likely to support that or vice versa. So people like the idea of someone from the other team kind of changing sides. But there's a study from 2017 that shows actually, so while these views are very malleable, people will change their views on welfare, on taxation, on almost any policy. There does seem to be like one exemption from this, and that's culture war issues. So this study, you can look it up, is Moral Power, How Public Opinion on Culture War Issues Shapes Partisan Predispositions and Religious Orientations. It's quite a mouthful, I know. Um, but basically, there's emerging evidence that shows that the most primitive emotions like disgust and sense of purity are a good predictor of views on issues like abortion and gay marriage. Um, I forget the name of, of, of that guy that you know wrote the book about this, about how things like harm avoidance and openness and stuff decide like where you'll be on, on a political compass and what values you'll emphasize politically. Another research has shown a good deal of durability on stances related to these issues. So, you know, like I said earlier, there's research that done uh, done that found people's ideological stances have like 0.3 to 0.5 durability across only four years. They're, they'll happily change their positions. But again, this is a this is a difference. Um, you know, if you are very pro-choice when you're 18, you're unlikely to be very pro-life in in your 40s, right? These positions are pretty steady across life they are more part of someone's identity than any of the rest of their politics and the study finds that i put in brackets in america because i don't think this applies nearly as much outside the u.s that culture war divide shapes loyalty more than any other issues contrary to the dominant perspective citizens habitually update their party loyalties their beliefs about their preferred religious texts and their religious commitments to better reflect their preferences on the vice of culture war issues and while this applies to the U.S. in recent years, that is a country undergoing intense polarization with deep cultural divides. So it's unlikely these issues are strong in determining behavior in other democracies. And like I said, some of that research about follow the leader, about people changing their beliefs to follow a political party leader, a lot of that comes from Europe. I think it's a lot more true there. You know, in, in France or in the U.K., in Germany, this isn't as central to politics like the stance on abortion on um, the lgbt stuff gay marriage there's much more consensus politics on that stuff but in the us certainly a culture war has come to dominate and this study shows that people actually will abandon their political party in that case so you know you can you can see that like trump came out and he, he's for big spending and he's for nationalist government and people will kind of flip to embrace those positions but if he came out and he was um you know if if he was suddenly uh pro-choice uh, and he, he flipped on abortion and, and some of these other issues it, then it's not like they would just follow him so there is a point past which you know the, the conservatives will say no more and the liberals as well um you know people have this idea well if we can just get the the leftists back to focusing on economic issues well this is the same for the leftists that the thing that's most important to them is these these liberal social values uh, on things like gay marriage and abortion. So these are kinds of political tribes in a way, and they're sort of they are sort of more fundamental than ideology. But like I said, this doesn't translate so much outside uh, the U.S. Although there is a kind of process with the internet where you see. I think you see the the worst of the left online. You see the the most hardcore of the right online. And people can access the radicals of either side. I think the internet is like accelerating this polarization process where these tribes become more, they become more visible to everyone uh, in society and become more entrenched. That seems to be the process that happens uh, with the internet and with, with mass democracy. And so that process of, of the culture war that we've seen happening in the U.S., I think probably will start trickling down. We will start seeing more of that in, in European politics. And you do kind of see it, you know, you, you do kind of see it already. I mean, even in Ireland, you have like these sort of patriot types that are very, 
they're very much adopting the values of like U.S. conservatives. They're, you know, they're sort of tribally identified with those people. And obviously you have this internationalist left that's all about, you know, uh, trans rights, human rights and, and all this stuff. That's, you know, that's very much like a sort of global tribe as well. So you can see those two political tribes kind of um, solidifying and, and like I said, making themselves visible. And so while this is a study that applies to the U.S., I think it will apply more and more across the rest of the West as well. But it shows you that this will really be deterred the, the determinant issue, okay? Like the Republican Party, conservatives can move to, you know, multiracial working class populism, right? They can embrace more socialist, populist economic policies and they can abandon like some of the old libertarian style economics they hung on to. Um, and that won't really change things. But what's what's going to matter is is that they're representing their base in, in the culture war issue, right? Like the the Matt Walsh, what is a woman stuff? Like he's very much representing uh, where the conservatives are, and that's where the, the, so that's where the push from the base is going to be on the left and the right now is is representing them on these culture war issues. Which you know you can think that's that's a good or a bad thing. It certainly means that the the conflict in, in politics that we've seen over culture war issues is, is not going to go away. It's only going to deepen. And just to finish off, I took some choice quotes from this book. Uh, the conclusion, at least, that I thought were interesting, he said that the folk theory, uh, the folk theory of democracy, is like the ether theory of electromagnetic and gravitational forces. It is based on 19th century intellectual foundations and the empirical evidence has passed it by. Moreover, the internal contradictions in that conceptual framework, illuminated by Arrow's theorem, cut off all obvious escape routes from the conclusion that the, fo- uh, the, that the folk theory is fundamentally unworkable. Citizens are unlikely to know whether crime has gone up or down, only whether gruesome murders appear in the local news. Their judgment about the seriousness of environmental threats are virtually uncorrelated with those of experts. Even in the domain of the economy, where detailed statistical information is plentiful and retrospective voting is a powerful electoral force, voters may fixate on current conditions to the neglect of the incumbent's full record. And I would add as well about economics. I mean, economics is a very complicated, uh, you know, it's a very complicated science. And there's, there's, there's so much dispute in economics between, you know, the Keynesians, the Neo-Keynesians, the you know the supply siders, the, the the Austrian school type people, and um, you know people that for modern monetary theory, and there's all these kinds of theories that are very much in 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 conflict with each other. And the idea that anyone could, you know, the idea that voters could make a good decision about the economy is just, I think it's just ridiculous on its face. I mean, I know like right wingers like to do this. I've seen this a lot. Current song, or like, oh, these these silly economists with their big theories about how ma- macroeconomics works. Uh, you know, the common sense of, of of ordinary voters knows that like you don't spend more than you take in. Like it's a household budget, and uh, you know you you know you you spend what you can afford, and this kind of thing. It's like, well, actually, actually, national budgets are kind of complicated, and actually, like there may be reasons to run a deficit, and maybe. Uh, you know, maybe like there's a role for economic stimulus and all these kinds of things. But it's like even within that, there's so many deep debates between economists that have been studying this all their life. I mean, it's like the idea that there would then be any wisdom in in people uh, like coming up with a, a, an economic position on the spot. I think it's just ridiculous. And they say, where does this leave the current state of democratic theory? The short answer is in a shambles. All the conventional defenses of democratic government are at odds with demonstrable, centrally important facts of political life. One has to believe six impossible things before breakfast to take real comfort in any of them. Some of these standard defenses romanticize human nature, some uh, mathematicize it, and others uh, bodlerize it. But they all have one thing in common. They do not portray human beings realistically, nor take honest account of our human limitations. The result is that from the viewpoint of governmental representatives, uh, representativeness and accountability, election outcomes are essentially random choices among the available parties, musical chairs. Elections that throw the bums out typically do not produce genuine policy mandates, not even when they're landslides. They simply put a different elite coalition in charge. 
this is what an honest view of electoral democracy looks like. And I think that's a pretty solid conclusion. Yeah, mass democracy, you take a look back at the history of it, you look at these huge swings and throwing out governments and putting in new governments and electing coalitions. And it's all kind of meaningless, ultimately. Uh, it is kind of sort of decided on, on economic policies and, and how good campaigns are, how well campaigns are run. If the media decides that someone's had a scandal, that's that's very serious and they blow it up. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, on the level of like establishment parties like Labour versus Conservative, uh, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, GOP uh, Democrat, on that level, it, it might as well be random, honestly. Uh, you know, when, when you look at the motivations, when you look at the tiny percent that know anything about politics, let alone have like an ideologically consistent position, and the fact that their votes aren't even really influencing things. Um, yeah, electoral musical chairs. Now, of course, the problem is, um, you know, how do you move beyond that? And, and the authors, the authors have this very critical view of democracy, but they don't say, well, okay, let's have a dictatorship or something. And they even, they do try and offer some defense of democracy, uh, like a very weak defense where it's like, well, you know, maybe if, if the politicians think they have to go up for election in four years, uh, even if, if the process basically means nothing, you know, maybe it will, it will try and get them uh, to work hard at their job or something. But, you know, in terms of an honest defense, I mean, the only real defense is that we can't think of an alternative um you know within liberal democratic theory within this post-enlightenment liberal world we live in we can't we just don't have the language to uh, come up with an alternative system and what would that even look like let alone when you have these like i said these two competing tribes that see it as an existential battle with the other one and that's the other real reason for mass democracy is it, it keeps it, it keeps everyone just about happy enough that they will avoid violence. Uh, it, you know, the it gives people a sense that their popular sovereignty has been respected, that in some way the country has come together to agree on the government and that's their mandate. Uh, and that, that avoids like real political conflict and, and, and violence. But um, in terms of being a serious representation of what the people want, if that even means anything, because the people themselves don't know what they want and they can't even express a preference that can't just be totally manipulated the other way with the change of a word or a, you know, a, a simple media campaign or something. But in terms of it presenting uh, representative government or responsive government, um, you know, the, the dynamics just aren't there. So all of the standard defenses of democracy kind of fall apart on the level of, of mass democracy, mass electoral democracy. And there's really nothing left intellectually to defend it with. So that's all. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, like I said, something a little different. You don't find a lot of works like this within sociology, within, pol within political science, but I thought it was interesting to take a look and get some of this stuff, put it together and actually see, okay, you know, we we all have these sort of simple, sort of catchy critiques of democracy, but what happens if you just take a look, you know, from, from the perspective of what democracy says it is, and putting that up against, you know, real research and real political science done on this? I think that the case is, is pretty convincing. So, yeah, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this. Subscribe, and take care.